If I had a dollar for every time I get to show this diagram in one of my videos, I'd be rich like this guy. Or this one. Anyway, the reason that I'm showing this today is because we're going to add three new stages to the OpenGL pipeline. Actually, they are not really new, having been part of OpenGL 4.0 in 2010. By the way, I do have a couple of tessellation tutorials on my website from late 2011, so I guess I wasn't really that late to the game. Ok, let's get into it. In a recent video I demonstrated how the geometry shader can be used to drop vertices or create new primitives. The tessellation stages provide yet another method for generating geometry on the fly and can be used for multiple effects. In this video we will see one such use case, the tessellation of a Bezier curve. The key component in the tessellation process is the stage in the middle called the tessellation primitive generator or TPG. I'm not a big fan of this name so I'm going to call it the tessellator in this video. It's like the terminator only in reverse. The tessellator is a fixed function pipeline stage. This means that it performs a hard-coded algorithm which is embedded in the hardware itself. You can configure it using a few configuration knobs which we will see later on but it is not a shader unit which can execute regular shader code like the vertex geometry or the fragment shaders. Now I said a hard-coded algorithm but there are actually three to choose from and all of them involve some form of subdivision. These algorithms are called quads, triangles and isolines and each of them subdivides the respective shape and outputs a series of two or three dimensional points in the range of 0 to 1. Combined with the other two stages, these points can be used to do the actual subdivision of the standard lines and triangles into smaller pieces. It's important to stress the fact that the tessellator doesn't care about the actual vertices that are passing through the pipeline. It simply subdivides one of the three basic shapes according to its configuration. This brings us to the next critical concept. The tessellation process works on a new topology type called a patch and this is the only topology type that can be used here. If you try lines or triangles it will simply not work. So what is a patch? A patch is a group of vertices that have no predefined geometric shape. It's better to think about a patch as individual vertices rather than some sort of a complex surface. The number of vertices in the patch is constant across the entire draw call and must be specified using GL patch parameter i and the parameter GL patch vertices. This number must be between 1 and a value which can be queried using GL max patch vertices. The maximum is implementation dependent but has to be at least 32. For example, if we set GL patch vertices to be 10 and call GL draw arrays on 100 vertices, the system will execute the tessellation process on 10 patches. Notice that the patch doesn't go all the way until the end of the pipeline, so it's not something that the rasterizer needs to understand. We will talk about the final shape a bit later. We are now ready to discuss the first stage in the tessellation process, the tessellation control shader or TCS. This is a regular shader stage, so we have some GLSL code to execute here. Before we jump into the TCS, let's understand the role of the vertex shader when tessellation is active. The truth is that nothing really changes from the point of view of the VS. It still executes once per input vertex before the system assembles the vertices into patches to be sent to the TCS. You can use it for some basic manipulation but as you shall see, since tessellation is going to generate a new group of vertices, it's probably better to skip the world view projection transformation that we are used to at this stage. But the VS is still there and it's still mandatory, so the minimum is to have it pass through the vertices. Back to the control shader. The main job of the TCS is to configure the behavior of the tessellator. This is done by setting a few tessellation level variables. In a nutshell, these variables tell the tessellator how many subdivisions to perform. For example, you can make the number of subdivisions dependent on the distance from the camera and thereby implement a system of level of detail. 
The TCS is actually an optional stage, so if it's not present, the patch goes directly from the VS to the tessellator, and the default values of the tessellation levels are used. The TCS itself is executed on every vertex in the patch, and in this respect it is similar to the vertex shader. The difference is that while the VS has access to the attributes of the current vertex only, each invocation of the TCS can access the attributes of all the vertices in the patch. So if the main job of the TCS is to set the tessellation levels and there is only one such set, you may be asking yourself why is the TCS executed on every vertex in the patch? The reason is that the TCS can also modify the input vertices and even change the number of vertices in the output patch. This means that in the shader code of the TCS, we have a combination of per vertex code that calculates the output vertices based on the input vertices and also per patch code which is the same for all the vertices in the patch. Now, this last part is not entirely true, but I don't want to confuse you too much, so let's assume that it is for now. Since the tessellator ignores the output vertices of the TCS, their destination is actually the shader stage after the tessellator, but let's talk a bit more about the tessellator first. So we have three basic shapes that can be subdivided. In this video, we are going to use only ISO lines, so let's focus on that. The other two shapes will be addressed in future videos. The isolines algorithm subdivides the four corners of a normalized square into horizontal lines, which are further subdivided into segments. We use the coordinates uv in this square in the same way as in textures. u goes from left to right, and v goes from bottom to top. Every such line has the same number of segments. There are two tessellation levels here, which are accessible in the TCS using the two elements of the GL test level outer array. The first element sets the number of lines. If we have a single line, then it is on v equals to zero. If we have two lines, we have an extra line at v equals 0.5. In general, if we have n lines, then the following lines are created, and as you can see, we never reach v equals to 1. The second tessellation level sets the number of segments along each line. The segments are equal in length, and as you can see, they are very easy to calculate. By default, the tessellator outputs a line list by creating pairs of vertices for each segment. However, you can configure it to output a list of points by specifying point mode in the input layout specifier of the tessellation evaluation shader. So now it's time to talk about this shader stage, which is the last of the three. The TES is similar to both the VS and the TCS, in the sense that it is executed on every output vertex that comes out of the tessellator. The TES is mandatory, so we have to write it, and it can access all the input vertices, same as the TCS. The job of the evaluation shader is to take the output vertices of the TCS and the results of the tessellator, and combine them into something meaningful. In this video, we will interpolate between the vertices of the patch using the output from the tessellator. The results will be transformed all the way to clip space, which is why I said that we should avoid this in the VS. The output from the TES is assembled into lines or triangles, depending on the tessellator algorithm, and then sent on to the GS if it is present, or directly to the rasterizer if there is no GS. Ok, I hope that you now have a general idea of how tessellation works in OpenGL, but to make it really stick, we have to put this in practice. So let's use it to render a Bezier curve, which I'm sure you have already seen in the past, because it's so useful for many applications, from animation to robotics and more. We have a set of control points, and the curve is interpolated from the first point to the last point. In this specific example, we have four control points, and this is called the cubic Bezier curve. To interpolate between the control points, we use a set of functions with the general name blending functions. Specifically for the Bezier curve, the Bernstein polynomials are used as the blending functions. By the way, the Bezier curve was invented by French engineer Pierre Bezier while he was working for Renault. The general form of the Bernstein polynomials is as follows. 
This looks a bit intimidating, so let's break it down. What we are actually calculating here is a single polynomial i, where i goes between 0 and n. n is called the degree of the polynomial. t is the parametric parameter, which can go from 0 to 1. On the right-hand side, we first have the binomial coefficient n over i. This is a fraction where the denominator is the product of all numbers between n minus i plus 1 to n, and the denominator is the product of all numbers from i to 1. Using the factorial notation, we can write this more efficiently as follows. The binomial coefficient is multiplied by 1 minus t to the power of n minus i, and finally by t to the power of i. So this is a single Bernstein polynomial. In the case of the Bezier curve, we have to multiply each control point by the corresponding Bernstein polynomial and sum up the results. In the cubic Bezier curve, we have four control points, so we have to calculate the following sum, where each polynomial is as follows. Okay, so the bottom line is that the location of each point along the line depends on the four control points and the interpolation factor t, which goes between 0 and 1. When t is set to 0, we get the first control point. When it is 1, we get the last control point, when it is 0.5, we get the center point of the curve, and etc. So the first instinct is to divide the 0 to 1 range to whatever number of points is required, and calculate the position for each value of t. We can now render line segments between each pair of consecutive points, and naturally, the more segments we have, the smoother the result will be. That's cool, but this subdivision is exactly the job of the tessellator. We can use the isolines algorithm to subdivide a single line segment to as many segments as we want. The tessellator will spit out the values of t based on the requested number of segments, and the evaluation shader will use the Bezier curve equation to calculate the result for each value of t. First of all, we have to prepare an array of vertices, where every vertex is a two-dimensional point, which is basically our control point. As you can see, we have four of them. This array is loaded into the vertex buffer. Next comes the vertex shader, which is very simple. It takes the 2D point as input, expands it to a homogeneous coordinate where z is equal to 0, and w is 1. Next comes the TCS. Here we use the layout qualifier to set the number of vertices in the output patch to 4. So in this case, we are not changing the size of the patch. We have 4 vertices in the input patch, and 4 vertices in the output patch. We also have a uniform variable for the number of segments. The first line in the main function copies the input attributes to the output. Notice how this works. We have the glin and glout arrays for the input and output, respectively. The two arrays have the same structure, with the position, the point size, and clip distance as members. We are only interested in the position, so this is what we copy. Each invocation of the TCS can access the entire GLIN array, all the input vertices, but it can only write to a single element in the output array, the one that corresponds to the current TCS invocation. So GL invocation ID runs from 0 to the number of output vertices minus 1. We have completed the per vertex part of the TCS. Next comes the per patch part. We have two tessellation levels that we can set. The first one is set to 1 because we want a single output line, and the second is the number of segments in that line. Notice how the uniform variable is cast from an integer to a floating point. Now you may be looking for a tessellator configuration to use the ISO lines algorithm, but for some weird reason it is part of the evaluation shader, so let's go there. And we can see the layout specifier up here. Perhaps the reason is that the TCS is optional, and the OpenGL designers didn't want to have a default for something like the subdivision algorithm. Anyway, we can see that the WVP matrix has been moved from the VS to the TES. Now let's see what this shader actually does. First of all, we need to remember that by now the tessellator has already been executed, so the results for the current output vertex are waiting 
in the internal variable GL test squared. This is a 3D vector, but in the case of ISO lines or quads, the third component is always zero. We have configured the tessellator to subdivide a single line, so only the X component contains actual data. This value, of course, can go from zero to one. Next, we extract the four control points from the GLIN array. They have skipped the tessellator and went directly from the TCS to the TES. We can now calculate the Bernstein polynomials for the current value of T, and then multiply each polynomial by the corresponding control point. Sum up the products and we get the final interpolated point. This point, of course, is considered to be in its local space, so we multiply it by the WVP matrix to transform it into world view and finally clip space. We don't have a geometry shader here, so this point goes directly into the rasterizer, which will rasterize the line segments created by the tessellator. And here's the result. If you run this code, you can choose a control point by clicking on the keys one through four, and then use the arrow keys to move the point around. If you want to see the results in points instead of lines, you can add point mode to the layout specifier in the evaluation shader. And that's it. I skipped quite a lot of features in the tessellation process to keep this video as simple as possible. These features will be covered in future videos, so make sure to subscribe, hit the like button, and I will see you next time.